Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Juliana Forlano Show, the second podcast of the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network. I hope you enjoyed the first one. If you didn't hear it, definitely go back. It's still valid, still important. And David Nywert on that show talks to us about the rise and continuing rise of white supremacy and where we are in the country and and what the future holds on that. But on today's show, of course, we're going to start out with my favorite segment, the headlines, and then we're going to move on to an interview with the guest who enlightens us on one of the issues, just one issue that no one's really talking about right now because we all have rightfully so indictment fever and then we all have heat exhaustion from what's going on with the weather. So we haven't really been paying attention to, I haven't even heard it much in the news, the one issue that if we were able to make some progress on, we would be able to definitely tip the scales in the favor of Democrats who, with all of their flaws, are at least pushable by public opinion at this point in our history. And that makes them the party that we need in power. Also, they're not fascists. So there's that. All that and a little bit more coming up on this edition of the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network. Stay tuned and subscribe and leave a comment and et cetera. Thanks for finding me. I'll be back in mm, probably eight seconds. On the headlines today, a crucial ocean current is showing signs of collapse. And the Federal Reserve is trying to keep our economy from not collapsing. But are they doing it in a wrong-minded way? Stay tuned. We'll discuss. Okay, everybody, a crucial ocean current is showing signs of collapse. You heard this report this week. I think it's probably one of the most important stories we heard this week, especially since as of the recording of this podcast, Donald Trump had not been indicted. But Donald Trump's indictment may arguably affect less people than the collapse of the ocean current uh, upon which our food system and ability to live depends. So here we are. That's that's how I picked this one as the most important story. So this upcoming collapse predicted to happen between the year 2025, which to me still sounds like it's a long way off because I was born, you know, when, when the idea of 2025 was like, we we're going to be in space, all living in capsules, et cetera. But it's actually only two years from now. <laughs> it's two years from now. The study says that between two years from now and, you know, 2095, which arguably is still soon, the current carrying warm water from the tropics to the North Atlantic is likely to collapse. They found that it has slowed down and has become less resilient because God damn it just can't take it anymore. I'm assuming that's why. That is the scientific definition of what the hell's going on here. Oh, they, anyway, by it, I mean, it can't take the melting Arctic sea ice, which desalinates and cools the water and basically slows down the flow. When this circulatory belt collapses, as I said before, which is likely to happen no oh, sometime before Leonardo DiCaprio's next girlfriend turns 35. <laughs> he likes him young, okay? She might not be born yet, but still, that's just, it's just not too far off. And also, shouldn't we care whether it's within our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes, or like forever? I think we should still care about that. Anyway, when it collapses, Scientists say we should expect dramatic weather changes on both sides of the Atlantic. And they mean even more dramatic than we are seeing now, I suppose. Not even more dramatic than Palermo, Sicily being on, you know, having fires. It's so freaking hot there. Greek, you know, fires, Greece, the temperature has been over. 111 degrees for days. I think it was over 150 degrees, I heard reported, in uh, Iran. So don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was Iran and not Iraq. 
it's pretty dramatic over there now. It's pretty dramatic here where I live every single day. We've had severe thunderstorm warnings and it's blazing hot in the West and it's 99 degree temperature water, or excuse me, 100 degree water off the coast of Florida, which to me seems a little bit like uh, a gun pointed at the United States because the next time a hurricane decides to flow over that area, rapid intensification is likely. Anyway, yes, if this belt collapses, we're looking at very dramatic very dramatic changes possibly um they're expecting a drop in temperature in northern europe and it's going to be real hot in the tropics and in between stronger storms than are already predicted then stronger storms if this belt thing collapses we're getting stronger storms than the already strong storms we're probably going to get this year with that 100 degree ocean temperature that we are seeing stronger storms on the east coast of north america are predicted. Now, here's this is what I found interesting about this story. Uh, the Washington Post, which I have pulled up here, the way they talked about it was that, you know, uh, the scientists have seen that this it's called the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation was vulnerable and it was going to be a tipping point. It's one of the elements are going into these tipping points, etc. The study that got published on Tuesday in the Journal of Nature Communications said that it was going to, as I said earlier, happen very soon. And then it goes on to talk about how scientists are like, oh, well, it may or it may not. It may happen later. It may happen sooner. No, that time period is very difficult. We can't we can't agree on the time period. What they did not say is that everyone agrees that this is going to happen. To me, who follows these things, and probably to you because you are an educated viewership, and that is why there are so few of you. Kidding. Uh, <laughs> you probably already knew that this belt was part of what we were watching, right? This belt of water, this circulatory system is part of what we're watching in terms of the collapse of the Earth's ability to sustain life as it is sustaining it now. We already knew this. So they are basically dickering over what year this is likely to happen. I would, I, I, the earliest is 2025 is what they say. It's 2023. I would just like to point out to everyone that um, maybe you've had this thought. Remember when they say the Arctic ice sheet was going to melt at a certain rate? It's going to happen in between these years. And, and then every week, it's like we have a new story. The Arctic ice sheet is melting faster than we thought. The Greenland ice sheet is showing far more melt than we thought. And then the next week, based on that already changed set point, the Greenland ice sheet is, you know, melting even faster than they thought last week, then even faster than the week before. So I don't doubt that this belt is going to mark my words, and I don't say this lightly, that this belt is going to collapse Certainly within my lifetime. Certainly within my lifetime. I'm not looking forward to it, let me just say. Possibly even sooner than that two-year near point. What do we do? Well, first we can encourage President Biden to declare a climate emergency. Absolutely, we need to do this. I encourage everyone to call your representative. I mean, sure, you can. Try to make your voice known directly to the president, but calling your representative, especially if they're a Democrat, to show support for Biden and then they could pass that support along. Call your senator, call your representative. Show support for Biden declaring a climate emergency. We have enough evidence now for him to do so, and that would give him expanded powers to do the things that we abs abs absolutely need to do in order to address this as soon as humanly possible. Leave your comments below. This is the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network. Of course, if you are listening on a podcast platform, you can leave your comments in the podcast platform 
If you're watching on YouTube, you can leave them there. I definitely read them. I love reading them. In the next story on the headlines, the Federal Reserve raised its key interest rate today. Why? Because nobody has the gullions to fight the rising consumer prices we see in the U.S. any other way. It's interest rates or bust. Nobody's going to do anything about price gouging. Nobody is doing gots, which is the Italian word for... Dick, we can say dick, right? Uh, nobody, you can bleep it, Casey, my intrepid producer. Nobody is doing cots about the runaway executive pay while the prices of their goods and services go up. Nobody is doing anything about those things, people. Now, if you want to beat out that big bank in a bidding war for the one bedroom, one and a half outhouse cottage in the flood zone, you'll be paying 5.5% on your $500,000 mortgage. So that's what's happening in housing. Inflation has fallen every month since June of 2020. It is still above normal levels. I don't know what normal levels might be at a time like this. But I'm going to ask our, our, our friend, the economist, Dean Baker, to join us next week and have that discussion. But I do think it's important that we talk about how inflation has fallen every month since June 2022, and we give President Biden some credit for that. This would be important. Yes, I have to say, sometimes it's, you know, okay, we've got the Federal Reserve tweaking the prices, and that's important, and we could talk ad nauseum like they do on some news channels about that, etc. But it really seems uh, discordant to talk about some of those things when basically the big don't look up climate comet is coming right at our face. I mean, there is no corner of this earth that is not being affected by climate change, by climate chaos. I think we can all agree now, except for the crazies. I don't, what are they saying is happening to the weather? Uh, is Biden, Hunter Biden's laptop is controlling the weather now? I don't know. <laughs> all I know is that I, I, I give kudos to these researchers who did this research, even though so much research has already been done showing that the collapse is imminent, the collapse will happen, et cetera. They did this research story and then it came out in the news at the exact time that is absolutely necessary for us to take action, for us to start taking political action to move some of this forward. I give very much kudos to that. That was very, thank you, scientists. I appreciate I appreciate your time on that one. Definitely not fear-mongering. And definitely worth having in the news. I'm Juliana Forlano. These are the headlines for the Political Voices Network. Stay tuned. Up next, my guest is going to talk about, as I promised, he's going to talk about the one issue that if we all cared about might tip the election in favor of the not fascist party in the United States. Stay tuned. I don't know if you noticed, but Minnesota recently legalized marijuana for recreational use, making it the 24th state to do so. We're almost halfway there. But of course, the war on weed and the people who need it or use it is far from over. Why? Uh, money? And racism. Joining us to discuss this and how this issue plays into both our current political scene and how we got in some of the hot water that we are in now. Did you know that legalizing marijuana could have tipped the scales in Florida so that we would have Al Gore as the president back in the George Bush years and then maybe we wouldn't have gone to war? with Iraq. Maybe would have saved billions of dollars. Maybe, maybe, maybe we would have addressed climate change, you know, with a little more of a buffer to actually do something about it. Stay tuned. My guest, Peter Crispoon, he is a primary care physician, a doctor. So after the interview, I'm going to ask him to check my mole. And he is also a widely recognized expert on cannabis, drug policy, and cannabis science. In fact, he is a cannabis specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Okay, so he knows stuff. He's not just some internet health guy from Jupe. 
He's a certified health and wellness coach too, and a board member of the advocacy group Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. He's been providing medical cannabis care for patients for 20 years. His new book is called Seeing Through the Smoke, a Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana, where Dr. Grisboon untangles the truth about marijuana. Stay tuned. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, first of all, your dad, the late Dr. Lester Grisboon, was the, a psychiatrist and an academic who risked a Harvard career to challenge the laws and beliefs about marijuana long before it was fashionable to do so. And you carry on that tradition. So I want to thank you for that. And I had a great mentor. My dad was uh, fearless and uh, very um, a lot of integrity as a scholar and as an academic. And he has been fighting for to educate people about um, medical and recreational cannabis and about legalization for the last half century until he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, well, let's start, let's start with politics and then we'll get into why it took, why, why people still are, are afraid of marijuana, are unaware of its benefits, the history of that. But one of the 23 states that have legalized, I noticed there's a mix of red and blue states. Certainly the most liberal states are included, but they weren't always the first ones to go. Um, there are several purple states as well. Is cannabis legalization becoming a bipartisan issue? Well, absolutely. Um, most Americans support cannabis legalization. One poll, recent poll shows that 94% of Americans support legal access to medical marijuana. Now, name anything that 94% of Americans agree on. They don't even <laughs> agree that the sky is blue or that the earth is flat. And who would have thought that cannabis would be the issue that unites them? And more than two thirds of people including more than half of Republicans now support uh, full legalization for adult use or recreational cannabis. So um, most people support it with good reason, which we'll discuss, but most people support it. And it's becoming less and less controversial. As you mentioned, 23, 24 states have legalized it fully for adult use and, and, and 38 states have now legalized it for medical use. Nobody's talking about unlegalizing it. It's been extremely successful. Um, where we've uh, legalized cannabis for adult recreational use. The teen use is stable. The car accidents are stable. The uh, use of opiates are going down. Uh, people are using a safer product. It's, it's been successful across the board. Why do some of the deepest red states uh, still resist? Is it still the racial motivation? Uh, because, Or is it because the prison industrial complex makes so much money off of keeping people incarcerated? Or what? what is it that keeps the red states from getting on board if there's 94% support? Yes, all of the above. Um, now, it, 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 there's a lot of stigma and a lot of propaganda from a half century of the war on drugs. So a lot of people still think that cannabis is like, not many, fewer people every year, but there's still a lot of people that think it's a satanic narcotic, which it certainly isn't true. I mean, cannabis has its harms. There are certain people that, that certainly shouldn't use it, pregnant, breastfeeding, teenagers, if you have a history or family history of psychosis. But Beyond that, it's clearly safer than alcohol or tobacco, and it, it benefits people. It helps helps them both medically and in terms of uh, sort of mindfulness and connecting and living in the moment and co connecting with music and art and sex and so forth. So there's just a stigma. Well, America doesn't want that, especially the red <laughs> states. So you answered my question. <laughs> you said the word, I'm sorry to cut you off and ask, but you said the word satanic. Is there uh, like a religious concern? Uh, is there is there some some push from the, the religious community to uh, that I'm unaware of? I think the hardcore evangelicals are not particularly, which there are a lot of them in, in the U.S., um, are, are, are not particularly enthusiastic about the cannabis legalization. At the same time, a lot of members of these groups are finding through sick family members that it really helps with cancer pain, with chemotherapy, with weight loss, with insomnia, with anxiety, uh, with chronic pain, which millions of Americans suffer from. So on the one hand, you have this like ideologic opposition, a lot of which frankly stems from like Nixon in the 60s and associating it with the left wing. But that's being overshadowed by people's lived experience uh, getting getting help and getting relief. I mean, it was really interesting. I remember 
you know, I think it was in 2016 or 2020, uh, the head of Trump's super PAC said, I don't care what Trump thinks about cannabis. I support it because it helped a family member get through cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think little by little people are learning through the lived experience, their own lived experience or the lived experience of their loved ones or acquaintances that it actually can be quite helpful and isn't the harmful, dangerous substance that has been sort of falsely portrayed as for the last half a century. That's interesting. You know, I visited some relatives recently, some of my older relatives. They live in a red area where the media has is basically right wing media. Sinclair has bought the little yeah. local stations. Um, but this has been happening for quite a long time. They they were aghast that marijuana legalization was happening in the state of New York. This is where we are. They were just they couldn't believe it. And no matter how much I tried to tell them about the benefits of it, they really could not overcome the propaganda that they have been hearing since Reagan and before. Can you talk about the history of propaganda, including what you discuss in your book, how the AMA was responsible for some unscientific and let's call it racially charged uh, misinformation? Uh, can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, cannabis was never criminalized for health or wellness purposes. That wasn't even part of the discussion. It was all about racism. They were trying to taint and stigmatize the Mexicans coming up from the southern border. That's why they changed the name from cannabis to marijuana to sound, make it sound like more foreign and scary. It always used to be cannabis. I mean, remember- I did not know that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's the same racism at the southern border now, that, then that we have now. Um, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, cannabis was illegal- and widely accepted medication in this country. Uh, there were more than 100 scientific papers written about it. Doctors freely prescribed it. And then, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s, this guy named Harry Anslinger, notorious racist. He was the head of the first Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which was like the predecessor to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. He went after sort of stereotypes about African-Americans and black musicians and Mexicans coming up from the border. And it was really based on two things, the criminalization of cannabis. It was based on just flat out racism. Uh, there are all these stories about how your white daughter will smoke cannabis with someone black and get pregnant and get an STD. All these awful, ugly stories that were perpetrated by Hearst Media. And the reason Hearst Media was involved is because th the second reason is that there were competing commercial interests. The paper industry, the silk industry, the petrochemical industry, they didn't want the competition from hemp. So it was really not based on medical concerns at all. It never has been, actually. Um, now, interesting with the American Medical Association, when it was criminalized in 1937, uh, the American Medical Association was very much against the criminalization. They were prescribing it. Doctors were all in favor of it. And then under withering pressure from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the doctor, uh, the doctors switched sides and just like decided they were against it in a very mm -hmm. short time. And... You know, I have a whole chapter in my book, Seeing Through the Smoke, called Do Be No Harm, which is about how doctors have been on the flat out wrong side of the war on drugs and have been contributing to this awful war on drugs, which very few people think was successful. I mean, with cannabis, all we've accomplished is ruining lives um, by criminalizing a behavior that is, first of all, fairly harmless. And second of all, people do anyways. Why criminalize things that people do anyways? So we've had 20 million arrests. Uh, for nonviolent cannabis possession in the United States over the last 50 years. And, uh, you know, four to one, it's been people with black and brown skin, even though blacks and whites use cannabis at the same rate. It's been just a horrendous mechanism of social control and punishment. So very few people support the war on drugs uh, these days. Doctors are sheep and they tend to follow. So they followed along and became anti-cannabis. And now they're following along the 94% of patients who are in favor of medical cannabis. And now about two thirds of doctors support medical cannabis. So we're, we're getting there, but groups like the AMA have not been helpful uh, on cannabis. They've been uh, really just ridiculously awful. Like they, I have all these like really racist quotes in my book, which I'll spare you, but the, suffice it to say, back when cannabis was legal and the AMA was supporting it, 80% of doctors were members of the AMA. Now that and there are other issues, but this is just sort of representative of the AMA's attitude. Not that the AMA is so conservative and boneheaded about things like medical cannabis, 
the membership of American doctors has dropped from 80% to 12%. So there are a very a small fraction of doctors actually listen to or participate in anything the AMA does. And part of it is because they take such awful positions on things like cannabis. Oh, that's fascinating. But the AMA is still sort of a, a respected um pillar of uh, reference for the media. So I don't not think by most people... doctors, I, not by most doctors, ironically, right, but by people. And I don't think people really I'm glad you pointed that out here, because I don't think people really know that most doctors are not don't support the AMA. That's that's really fascinating. Thanks for that. I imagine the pharmaceutical industry isn't thrilled to have legalized marijuana cutting into their Xanax profits or any of the other anti-anxiety, pain relief, other other profits. Can you talk about what you've seen in terms of their interference with legalization? For example, they've been against every single state-by-state -state legalization ballot initiative, be it for medical or recreational. And, you know, I think it was in Arizona where they had Insys, for example, that was an awful company that got in trouble for getting kickbacks for fentanyl lollipops for children and all that. They were a horrible company, but they contributed half a million dollars against the legalization campaign. Why? Because they were developing their own cannabinoids, which you'd have to buy with a prescription. So the whole uh, paradigm that the pharmaceutical company wanted to implement was that cannabis remains illegal, but you have to buy your cannabinoids, which everybody recognizes cannabis and cannabinoids have medical benefit, or virtually everybody. I'm testifying in a court case this afternoon where they're going to pretend that it doesn't, but they wanted to <laughs> They wanted to have cannabis be illegal so that they could produce cannabis-like molecules that we'd have to buy, you know, at exorbitant costs. Now that legalization is sort of out of the bag, I think big pharma has generally accepted a more, if you can't beat them, join them uh, attitude. And now they're sort of, along with alcohol and tobacco, trying to take over the cannabis industry, Oof. which presents other problems. <laughs> mm, mm. Um, let's talk about that, um, the... The propaganda machine. I remember when I was young, and I'm going to date myself here. Um, I wrote a letter. I was probably five or so. Eight, <laughs> I don't know something when I could first write. I wrote a letter to uh, Nancy Reagan and told her that I was going to just say no because she in did some invitation to kids writing, and she wrote me back. And wow. I was, I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, President. Vice, you know, first lady of the U.S. writing me, you know, and at the time you didn't know they just stamped it with a sticker and it was somebody you just it was a whole thing. And she kind of it 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 made an impression on me as a youngster that drugs are bad and you should stay away from them at all costs, etc. Now, reading your book, I came to find out that the Partnership for a Drug Free America was being funded by the tobacco and alcohol companies. Also drugs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that situation and some of the other propaganda that um, has come out uh, that, that people have become aware of? Well, first of all, it's so arbitrary in our society which drugs are the good drugs and which are the bad drugs. Uh, alcohol is good. The psychiatrists all drink it, but they criticize cannabis. Uh, tobacco um, is good. Caffeine's good. You go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or a Narcotics Anonymous meeting and everybody's chain smoking cigarettes and guzzling coffee and talking about how bad opiates are. But then with opiates, I prescribe Oxycontin after someone has a surgery or breaks a bone. That's good. Heroin is bad. You go to prison for possessing it. They're virtually the same thing. We have medically prescribed heroin in Europe. So we need to start from scratch. You know, cannabis is schedule one. Psilocybin from magic mushrooms is schedule one, which means no medical utility and high abuse liability, neither could be further from the truth. So our drug policy and classifications have been based on racism, nonsense, and competing commercial interests. They have nothing to do with health and wellness. So I actually think we need to start from scratch. But, you know, the only way to wage a war on drugs was to taint and destigmatize drug users. And I think Nancy Reagan, honestly, personally, I know Reagan was a popular president, but Nancy Reagan has so much blood on her hands. Not with our audience. <laughs> her parents' campaign, she has blood on her hands. All she did is taint and stigmatize people who use drugs and people who are addicted. And she made it so that the supply was more dangerous. The cartels got stronger because we criminalized everything, which doesn't work. They militarized all the neighborhoods. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of African-Americans ended up in prison for no reason. And people with addiction are afraid to get help and afraid to talk about their addiction. So the propaganda has been incredibly, incredibly damaging and harmful. And you're right. It hasn't just been Nancy Reagan, the Clinton administration, Barry McCaffrey. He wanted to put doctors in prison 
after uh, California legalized uh, medical marijuana in 1996, if they prescribed it. And it's just been this whole cash cow. I mean, some of the biggest culprit is law enforcement. They don't want their budget taken away. They love policing cannabis. They, you know, there's so many racist police officers that just, you know, stop and frisk or they smell something and then they harass people. And not all police people are racist, but at the same time, they want their budgets. They want their big budgets. It's a big cash cow. The other big cash cow is the $50 million rehab industrial complex. I've been to rehab. Mm. I, I was addicted to opiates 15 years ago. The medical board sent me to rehab. Rehab is useless. I don't think that's how we should treat addiction at all, but that's a whole nother conversation. But the fact is half of the referrals to rehab have been through the courts. You know, a kid comes in with his parents and the judge says, do you want your kid to go to juvie or to rehab? And they go to rehab. Of course, what parent wouldn't pick that? So they call it cannabis addiction. And the kid gets treated for cannabis addiction when all the kid had was got caught using cannabis, not cannabis addiction. So the rehab is a big uh, culprit. As you mentioned, alcohol and tobacco industries were big culprits and law enforcement is a really big culprit. You know, the drug testing industry, there are a lot, a lot of people make money with cannabis legalization and a lot of make people make money with cannabis prohibition. And that's sort of who lined up for each state by state ballot initiative. Yet, you know, one side believes in criminalizing behavior that people do anyways, and the other side believes in not, you know, punishing people for, for a harmless activity that they do anyway. So I'm, I'm clearly on one side, but you know, both sides profit from, from, you know, the, whatever the situation is. Legalization isn't the be all and end all of fixing the problems that came from prohibition. These people who have been wrongfully uh, or, you know, thrown in jail with uh, for laws that are unjust, they need their criminal records expunged. You say, um, that there should be even more done for them in terms of now that now that legalization is is upon us. What needs to be done beyond just legalizing the drug? Well, I just wrote a piece about this in I think it was in Yes magazine. Like if we were to legalize cannabis everywhere tomorrow, there would still be people in prison. Uh, there would still be people, whole neighborhoods, whole generations that were harmed by this militarized war on drugs. And then when you get arrested and you get a criminal record, it affects your ability to vote, but your employment, your education, your student loans, your housing, it really can ruin your entire life. So we need to not only legalize cannabis, so we stop, you know, harming people for no reason. Uh, you know, we can, cannabis does have some harms. We educate people. We don't punish them. Law enforcement are the wrong people to be involved with drugs on any level. They don't know anything about it. And if you use a drug, you know, and then you get addicted, you need help. If you get involved with law enforcement, you have a third problem, you're involved with law enforcement. It just makes everything worse. It doesn't help at all. It doesn't deter people from using drugs. So we need to get people out of prison. We need to not just pardon. Pardon's like an apology. We need to expunge criminal records. So as you mentioned, criminal, expunging a criminal record makes it so that someone never had it on the record in the first place. So when they apply for a job or, you know, try to be a chaperone if their kids feel or try to vote. <laughs> yes, yeah, so yeah, as if they never had a criminal record. And the problem with expungement is that it's a little bit complicated. You need resources and you need education. So we need to help people expunge their records. And then finally, we have this new 10, 20, 40, 60 billion dollar industry, cannabis industry. We need to funnel many of the profits from the new industry into these areas and neighborhoods, usually areas where people of color live that have been harmed by the war on drugs so they can get back on their feet. So you're absolutely right. There's much more to do than just legalizing cannabis, though obviously legalizing is necessary, if not sufficient. This is fascinating, and I love this conversation. On this program, we talk a lot about two different things. Uh, one of them is voter suppression. The other is climate change. When it comes to voter suppression, we've seen in these different states and all manner of trying to get people of color who are likely to more than likely to vote Democratic off the voter rolls. In Florida, if you have a criminal record, I believe you're not allowed to vote. There was a legalization and then that got overturned by one of their, um, you know, uh, I think they did Republican something like governors. A poll, like a poll, like the Republicans did something like a poll tax so that people couldn't vote. So you can vote in Florida if you pay like some exorbitant fee to kind of. I think not if you're an ex convict. 
Oh, if okay. You're, I thought if you're an ex-convict, I don't think. Anyway, we can look it up. Those laws have been changing, but at one point in time, you know, people had been another whatever. Someone got arrested for voting in Florida because they had a criminal record and et cetera. Um, but I think it's just interesting to me from a from a, uh, a sociological perspective on how how these arrests can be used for the greater um, the greater aims of the Republican Party. <laughs> That's, you know, or maybe you're not going to get involved in, no, in no, the politics I'm, of it. But... I agree with you. I, there are like a million people in Florida that can't vote, usually mostly black people who will vote for Democrats. And this goes back to your first question about why the red states are opposing legalization. I mean, you know, many of the Republicans, even Trump said they don't want cannabis legalization initiatives on the ballot because that brings young people. Young people tend to be smart, idealistic and vote for Democrats. So um, it, it really is mixed in with the electoral politics. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Mm. Um, and then the other thing that you you said a couple of, well, many very interesting things, but um, you mentioned hemp and how hemp legalization was opposed by um, uh, the fossil fuel industry, I believe, because couldn't we run cars on hemp at a certain time? And then cars, plastics. I mean, it's amazing how much less of an environmental Someone should write a really interesting alternative history if they legal they never criminalized cannabis. We wouldn't have climate change. I mean, we might not. It just be really, really interesting. The funny part is that hemp became illegal with cannabis in 1933. And then during the war, they needed the rope. So remember that campaign, Hemp for Victory? They not only legalized it during the war, but gave a lot of incentives for farmer to grow it, farmers to grow it. And then after World War II ended, the drug war resumed, the other war resumed, and they had to criminalize, taint, and stigmatize cannabis and hemp again. So it's like the book 1984, where the people were voting for one, at peace with one country and at war with the other. And then the government says all of a sudden, oh, let's switch. And then all of a sudden they're not at war with Oceania and they're at war with another country. And somehow people go along with it. I don't get why the doctors went along with it. The doctors should know better. But I mean, when it comes to climate change, it, it is just so heartbreaking to read that history, given especially when I look out my window, what's happening and what's happening across the globe at this very moment where people are finally waking up to, oh, it's going to affect me. Yeah, it's going to affect you, you know, and it, it is just so it's just heart wrenching to think that at that period of time. I mean, I'm assuming no one had the foresight to realize what was, <laughs> was going to happen say, in 1930. They didn't know back then, but you're absolutely right. That's what I was saying. It'd be interesting to write an alternative history. There's also the plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean, which is yeah. like, is that like a thousand miles wide? We wouldn't have that if we're using hemp instead of- And the of plastics that are in our bodies now. I, you know, the plastics that are in everything, the plastics that are in the food. It's just incredible what's going on in that front and how it all ties together. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I, it's Do just you think really, that it's still possible to make a switch to a hemp-based, um, you know, hemp-based products that used to be plastic, hemp-based products that could drive automobiles? I know this might be outside of your your um, yeah, I, wheelhouse, I but are making hemp-based products, but the, the the huge corporations aren't. Right, and that's what sells like 99.9 percent. So you could find some nice artisanal a nice artisanal hemp bag or some nice yeah but i can't artisanally drive my artisanal car yeah. you know what i mean i got a, i got a regular standard car i got it yeah okay exactly. you could use yeah no i mean you could use possibly use hemp to produce some biomass produce some of the electricity for the electric cars i don't know well all right we'll look into that i i it's a it's one of those things like when when Howard Dean made that one Yelp and then wasn't elected president because of a microphone malfunction that you like, oh, we were this close to not having it be a disaster. That's how I feel about when fossil fuels won over against hell. Or when Al Gore lost. Ah, well, he lost. 537 he, votes. Well, he didn't exactly lose. Well, he, lose. He, lost. <laughs> he was handed the uh, the yeah, he was handed the election by Florida, not not via voting, right? By by the Absolutely. Supreme Court. But yes, imagine if those incarcerated folk for for those incarcerated for minor cannabis infractions in Florida had been able to vote probably for Al Gore. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of what ifs in this country. Seven incarcerated voters, there are about a million. I mean, it would have been a, a landslide for Al Gore. But Florida would probably be a blue or a purple state if we didn't have a million people who can't vote. So no DeSantis? Oh, you're killing me. Okay, yeah. well, this is great because you know a lot of people on this network and um, uh, just there's this 
this furor of following Donald Trump's um, indictments, which is very important, et cetera. I agree. But I, I on this show, I don't like letting these other issues fall off the table because, as you can see from our conversation, they are so important and they affect every other thing. They affect every other thing. So is is there um, what can people who are watching do in their states in order to forward this this uh, this movement? Well, first of all, I think education is critical. And we've all been taught such nonsense about cannabis. I mean, you know, epitomized in the, the D.A.R.E. program, which was just like completely like not accurate at all and actually led to an increase in drug use. I mean, you don't lie to teenagers. If you lose your credibility with a teenager, good luck getting it back. And they flat out exaggerated and lied about cannabis. The teenager said, these guys are idiots. And then they didn't believe the message on the other drugs. The other thing the D.A.R.E. program did is it made everybody think that everybody else was using drugs and that was normative behavior. So it actually increased drug use. I mean, wow. people need to educate themselves. That's part of why I wrote my book, Seeing Through the Smoke. It's for lay people it's, and for doctors as well. But it's like you have to be able to think for yourself on these issues. And the problem is we have these state by state legalization campaigns and both sides burnish their most extreme arguments. And usually the truth is somewhere in between. So you just have to think for yourself. And the headlines are always misleading. You have to read the studies themselves uh, if you can. And and the, the conclusions of the studies can be misleading because the researchers want to raise a, a certain point or two. So I just think scientific literacy and people thinking for themselves and educating themselves about all drugs of misuse so they don't have to rely on like the drug war nonsense. I think that's the most important thing people can do. You said earlier that cannabis can lead help with weight loss. I always thought cannabis led to the munchies. Well, it's a complicated metabolic thing. Cannabis definitely, um, definitely causes people to be hungry. Like in my cannabis using days, I can't have any junk food in the house because the chances of my not eating it are zero. And what I recommend to people is like, just exert some control at the supermarket. If you just have carrots and apples, there's only so much damage you could do when you get the munchies. You eat four apples. Nobody gets fat eating four apples is when you eat four bags of chips, which is what I would do if I were to use cannabis and I had access to chips. Now, of course, there's like go puff and stuff. So it's a little easier to get it delivered to your home. But the yeah. fact is chronic <laughs> cannabis users have a lower body mass index than non-cannabis users. And they don't quite know um, why. It might have to do with the microbiome. It might have to do with some cannabis is very complicated metabolically. It could have to do with the fact that like some studies have shown, you know, the whole thing that cannabis makes you amotivational is just such nonsense. You know, people who use cannabis exercise more and tend to exercise longer. They also, you know, tend to have more sex and have better sex. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why cannabis uh, could be contributing to, to people being thinner. Um, you know, it's interesting. They made a drug called Ramonabant. They said cannabis gives you the munchies. Let's block the cannabis receptor and cause weight loss. And it did cause weight loss. It was really effective. But the problem is if you completely block our ca cannabis receptors in our brain, people got really depressed and started committing suicides. So they had a they had to withdraw that drug off the market again because it was like epidemic of suicide. So, I mean, it's really interesting to think in the future, if you could actually target that part of your brain that makes you hungry, but not cause suicides, you really can maybe come up with some good weight loss drugs with cannabis. Of course, now we actually have for the first time, good weight loss drugs, those new injectable drugs like Ozempic, Wigovi, Manjuro. So that's not quite as pressing now that we have other weight loss drugs, but it's really intriguing possibility. I'm happy with the weight loss drugs because I know people really suffer from that issue, but I don't want to let these food corporations uh, <laughs> who are making addictive substances and, and putting them in the children's school lunch at, at the free lunch at school. I don't want to let them off the hook just because we have the drugs. So putting well, a plug that, in there. Not only that, more recent evidence shows that just eating highly processed food is really, really bad for you. It can cause cancer. It can cause dementia. It causes weight gain. So you're absolutely right. It's about quality and quantity. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed this conversation and um, I encourage everyone to go out and get the book. It's on the shelves now. The title is Seeing Through the Smoke, a Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana. And what I love about it most is that it's written in your voice. So if, as you can see on this interview, it's just such an enjoyable, it's an enjoyable kind of conversation to have an enjoyable read. And really, it really impressively informative. So I appreciate you doing that work. Well, thank you so much for having me. And if, if listeners have questions, I'm pretty easy to reach on my website. It's just 
um, www.petergrinspoon.com. There's a contact me. It actually just goes to my regular email. So I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Great. We're going to put that contact information at the bottom of this video and, and we'll, we'll, we thank you again for coming on. I hope you'll come back. Anytime. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. This has been the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network, wherever you're watching. I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe. Obviously, we're a new show, so we're building and building. And leaving a comment helps, too. So I'd appreciate that. First of all, I love to read them. Second of all, it helps the algorithm push this kind of info out through the fog and maze of online disinformation that is there. Thanks so much. I will see you next week.